Hey everyone, welcome to the Spatial Data Science Conference 2020. We're excited to see so many of you here, joining us from your living room, your bedroom, your garden, maybe even your office if you're lucky. I'm joining you from here, from the place where Carter was born, in beautiful Madrid. What a time to be part of this community. It's been a tough year for everybody, but there's never been a more important and exciting time to work with the spatial data. And this year's conference is bringing us together to talk about the most interesting projects. We welcome data scientists and analytics professionals from New York to Manila, from San Francisco to London and beyond. The work we've seen in the world of location intelligence to fight this pandemic has been incredible. With volunteers, not-for-profits, private and public sector organizations coming together to use map and spatial analytics. We've seen people like you running projects, tracking the progression of cases in different locations, modeling the relationships between mobility and infection rates, or measuring the effectiveness of lockdown in different regions. And after lockdown, adapting to a new normality by predicting the risk of overcrowding in the subway, or modeling the safe reopening of schools, offices, and venues or even defining the capacity of beaches during this summer. The list goes on and on. And your data wrangling, creativity, dedication, and spatial talents made it all possible. The world just got a crash course on spatial analytics in the last few months. I'm sure Jon Snow will be impressed by all your advanced analysis. At this conference, we're going to look forward though, and we're gonna to try to avoid saying new normal and unprecedented too much along the way. Yes, let's be honest, you've heard enough about that on Zoom the past nine months. We're going to look at many different location-based questions and challenges. Whether it's supermarkets or supply chain experts figuring out how to meet the demand on the increase on home delivery. Whether it's airports using indoor analytics, adapting to leisure and business pattern travel changes. How we move towards curbside pickup models and deal with commercial real estate oversupply consolidate inside networks. Cities analyzing how mobility is changing, our behavior, or companies moving towards remote working, or telco companies deciding where to roll out 5G or fiber optics first. Because you know, we are all in desperate need of that. Or more importantly, how we influence companies and governments to act on climate change and make our world more sustainable. All of this are a space of problems that require people like you to use new types of data and technology, which is what we are all going to be talking about throughout this conference, about spatial data science. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm truly excited for this week. This is the biggest conference we've hosted so far, with more than 5,000 people registered from all over the world. There are some great presentations from our speakers and some surprises. Of course, this year's conference is not typical. And for one, I'm doing this keynote in some conference sleepers. Yep, a year of changes as we've already discussed, but also a year of acceleration. A couple of years ago, I was talking about a neighborhood in New York City called Williamsburg. That neighborhood had gone through some major changes over the past years. From 2010 to 2019, as you can see on these Google Street View images, has transformed radically from an industrial area all the way to one of the most hip parts of the city. I was making the point that if you were to look at this neighborhood using census data, it will be challenging. Why? Because census data only gets collected every 10 years in most countries, so therefore it gets dated. Of course, there are yearly updates and other techniques to keep it up to date, but right now, base census data worldwide is almost 10 years old. So with the global events in 2020, Williamsburg, like many places in the world, has changed drastically again, but this time much, much faster. For example, in New York, a third of the population is considering leaving the city. Whatever analysis you had on that neighborhood and its population, well, it's probably no longer valid. What does this really show? that geography is now changing faster than ever before. Global warming and of course COVID-19 are pushing change at an unprecedented speed, modifying our environment, markets, society, well, pretty much everything. And the consequence of all that is 
that we have now a new set of requirements for space analysis. The study of geography is becoming much more real time and becomes out of date much faster too. Change can happen abruptly and you need to be ready. I see five new requirements when doing our work. Let's go through them. Number one, immediacy. We're now required to work in almost real time from a business question to a need for action in a very short period of time. Number two, freshness. Primary data that we work with on our analysis need to be fresh. We need to work with sources that can provide temporal granularity of less than a year, closer to monthly or even weekly or daily. Number three, multi-source. With these new data requirements, we have seen, particularly during COVID-19, you often will need to find multiple sources of data for completeness or validation. Number four, continuity. We're no longer looking at providing the best answer or most optimal solution in a particular time. We need to monitor over time how is that solution performing and optimizing it over time. Finally, number five, automated. Your analysis has to run on its own, instrumented and seamlessly connected to dashboards or decision tools. This is our new reality. But throughout the conference, we'd love to hear what other requirements and changes you have identified during these uh, tough times. But something is clear. To enable this type of requirements, we need to perform analysis in a different way. Luckily, there has been a revolution in recent years towards what we call cloud-native spatial analysis. A lot has been enabled by next-generation data warehouses, such as BigQuery, Snowflake, Redshift, Azure Synapse Analytics, these databases provide processing power that you can leverage through SQL or Python notebooks, but they have three characteristics that make them game changers from previous generations. First of all, they separate computing and storage. You can store as much data as you want very affordable at the cost of cloud storage and pay only on demand for the analysis that you make. Scalability. Of course, with the cloud comes the promise. Thousands of services are spending for you on demand. But let me show you an example. A very computing intensive task is the creation of tile sets. Essentially, slicing large data sets into tiles so that you can visualize them effectively. Carto has developed its own tiler on top of BigQuery, and now we can process 1.4 billion rows in less than 10 minutes instead of days. And those maps just look gorgeous. And the last one is my favorite, data multi-tenancy. It's like we are all living in a single database. But let me show you an example of that. Look at this query. We're now doing a join between tables provided by different providers. Each of them holding millions of records, no movement of data required. If a provider updates the data, your query is automatically refreshed. This is the basis for how Carto Data Observatory works. If you're using a next generation data warehouse, we can provide the data right in your database, just like another regular table. And we have grown a lot data observatory in this last year, with more than 5,000 data sets available from 33 new providers in 10 different categories. All these data sets are now available at a click of a mouse directly from the Carto dashboard or your Python notebook. And finally, we have started combining sources in a common support geography. The goal is to enable easier spatial modeling that is always up to date. Today, we're launching our new spatial features product, a global source of core demographics and POIs by category. This 2020 has been great for you, with the major next generation data warehouses adding spatial support to their products. Think of post GIS, but at the scale. This is a major step forward for our industry. And to talk about this, I would like to invite Chad Jennings, Product Manager of BigQuery GIS, to join me. Hey, Chad, the floor is yours. Thanks, Javi, for inviting me to join you. I'm Chad. I'm the GIS Product Lead for Google Cloud, and I could not agree more that 2020 is an important year for geospatial analytics. And Google's obviously been investing in geospatial for a long time, with this year's 15th anniversary of the launch of Google Maps. And one of the things that Google is doing is bringing the tech that we develop to create and deliver products like Google Maps to users of Google Cloud. And such is the case of geospatial support inside of BigQuery. As Javier already said, BigQuery is the next generation of data warehousing. 
And a couple of key things to understand about that. BigQuery can scale from incredibly small to incredibly large, from gigabytes to exabytes. And one of the reasons we can scale is because storage and complete, compute are completely decoupled in our product. Also, BigQuery is fully managed and serverless, so you don't have to worry about infrastructure. Google's pretty good at doing online infrastructure, so you can let us worry about that part, and that frees you to do the fun stuff, which is digging gems out of your data. We've got some unique capabilities to help you do just that. A couple of those are that we have machine learning and GIS verbs built right into the data warehouse. So that's the little text bullet down in the bottom right. Um, but those new SQL verbs aren't as much fun unless you've got cool data assets to play with. And BigQuery has more than 200 public data sets that we host for our users, i.e. that means Google pays for the storage and the data sets are cleaned, prepped, and ready to include in your queries. There's one data set that I really want to highlight here. And today we're announcing that in collaboration with Cardo, Google now offers OpenStreetMap as an always up-to-date public data set in BigQuery. So again, as part of our public data set program, Google hosts that for free. And OSM is also part of the collection of more than 30 COVID public data sets, which we launched back in March. The purpose of that was to help accelerate researchers and analysts and scientists with their work to combat the virus. So we've also made query free on those 30 COVID public data sets as well. And that'll stay true until September, 2021. So yep, free storage, free query, enjoy. But free access to OSM isn't the only innovation to discuss here. What you're looking at here is a tiled global rendering of 400 million building polygons in OSM. And Cardo is rendering these in a map after using BigQuery to generate the tile set of all 400 buildings, 400 million buildings, I should say. And that process took less than eight minutes. So being able to handle storage, computation on geospatial data at scale, that's been around since uh, about 2018 when BigQuery launched GIS support. What's really new and enabling here today is that Cardo has innovated so that interactive visualization can now match that scale. So with all three of these phases and analytic workloads finally operating at the same scale, BigQuery and Carto are unblocking geospatial data scientists and analysts from their past constraints. So I think that's a really big deal. So what might you do uh, if you could query and render all of OSM? Here are a couple more ideas to get you thinking. Firstly, this does open a lot of opportunities. For example, calculating the distance to health centers so that you can use that to mention your models. In this case, using H3, but we can get even more creative. Is it possible to do land classification using only labels inside of OpenStreetMaps? Well, we didn't know, so Google and Cardo collaborated to give that one a shot. Here's the algorithm we used. So just by using OSM features per tile, we counted the class name tokens and we split the tokens to create a bag of words. We use dimension reduce, or sorry, we use word to vec to reduce the dimensions, and then we clustered those vectors with a k-means uh, machine learning model, and we did all of this right inside of BigQuery. So, will this produce intuitive or meaningful results? Well, here's Seattle. Um, I'm actually doing this video from Seattle. I live in Seattle, and I live in one of the brown blocks here that are typified by you know floor, garage, and home. So, very typical suburban uh, or urban keywords. The lavender areas here that you see occur a little bit more north and south of the city um, are typified by words like commuter, transport, and you know, snarled, um, which might apply to more you know, pre-COVID uh, traffic patterns than post. Anyway, so that's very cool. Let's try it on a larger scale. So here's that same analysis applied to Los Angeles. And again, the colors of the cells are derived purely from the clustering of the labels associated with those cells. And you can clearly see the population centers arise. Um, you can see the intersections between the populated areas. So the yellow, the gray, um, and the call it more burgundy um, with the mauve of the mountains. So you can see this is an example of how you could do a very deep analysis with a lot of data. And you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You don't have to worry about moving data around. Rather, you allow the next generation infrastructure to support you with storage, ready to go assets, compute and visualization all at scale. So as I said earlier, we'll handle the infrastructure and allow you to focus on fun stuff, which is digging gems out of your data. So the Carto and the BigQuery GIS team cannot wait to see what awesome things you come up with with this. Enjoy.
and thanks very much. Thank you, Chad. It's great to see cloud platforms making Geo a core dimension. So in summary, today we need to work much faster and with even more data. Cloud native space analytics can help us do this efficiently, and if I'm honest, in a much more fun way without having to worry about all the plumbing. I'd like to wrap it up with a quote from 1990 from, from the great geographer Stan Openso. It is an appropriate moment to move on from the data-dominated GIS era towards a computational geography. And we are. We are entering the area of computational geography. The concept is not new, but only now it's possible, thanks to the cloud, and more needed than ever. Thank you very much. Javier. So Javier, the question was about uh, use cases in this new normal that we're living in. Uh, what are maybe the new emerging use cases that we see? So clearly the first one is we, we need better fiber optic and better connectivity, right? <laughs> so that's obviously number one. No, but I would just mention, I mean, like there's a part obviously on the public sector and everything around how, how we handle you know, like the pandemic from, a, you know, like the restrictions and how to optimize, you know, like containing you know, the virus while we still maintain your know, level of, um, of the economy going. So there's going to be a lot of analysis being done in that part. Then when we go to other sectors, there's obviously things like logistic optimizations where we've seen a huge increase in terms of you know like uh, uh, demand now, and as we move you know like even uh, even farther, as I was mentioning in the video, if you are a company that has been doing any kind of sort of market analysis, things have changed dramatically, just very very rapidly, right? So I was going to see you know a lot of like market analysis now just to understand this new normality, where there's you know like the opportunities, how you optimize your business to meet those needs. I think it's going to be, you know, just a lot of, you know, like redoing what we've done in the past right now with a new set of uh, a new set of requirements. If you say. Fantastic. And Javier, another question that's come through here on the Q&A. Um, we have lots of people who are joining from GIS communities today who are trying to upskill in data science uh, and maybe shift across from one type of role to another. What would be your advice to people uh, trying to work at the hybrid of GIS and data science? Well, I, th I think, you know, like GIS is an incredible background, right? That's, I mean, like, this is at the end, you know, where a lot of the foundational came, right? So it is a lot about, you know, like upscaling your capabilities, I would say, probably on a few things around data science in terms of, you know, like the usage of Python notebooks and more kind of like, you know, like data science type of tools. So that probably would be my recommendation. Start thinking about like how you can solve GIS problems but using also other technologies, other algorithms outside the traditional GIS, kind of like suite of you know, tools that you've been using. So that's that's number one. The second is like, there is an incredible amount of content nowadays on, on, you know, on the internet, on different kind of like forums, different, you know, that showcase about how to work around machine learning. And I think, you know, like a lot of the GIS have traditionally, I mean, hasn't yet, you know, like leverates these incredible new capabilities that, you know, from an analytical perspective, that's the other angle that I would call like dig into. Start looking at how to apply machine learning to a lot of the GIS that you've been doing in the past. And that in a way will also force you to use different tools and thinking, you know, like doing your work in a different way. Fantastic. Um, and in terms of data streams, you, you touched on data streams within your presentation, Javier, Chad also mentioned them. Um, what have been, in terms of mobility data, there's an increasing number of mobility use cases this year. What types of new data do you see companies starting to use that they weren't using one year ago as a result of the situation that we're in? Well, we've seen, you know, like a number of companies um, already, um, you know, requesting, you know, like as a car to, you know, things around, uh, like I was describing, you know, like what is the status, for example, of the economy, of the stores, of, you know, like, or, or retailers? Right. So we know that there's, you know, like an economic kind of crisis coming and you know, a lot of challenges that are going to come through it. So what are data sets that can help me to understand the situation in different parts? So that's that's I would say it's not so much about like what new data, uh, data products or data streams you're going to actually need. But the ones that you had, how can I have them faster? How can I have them more refreshed? How can I have them more, you know, like regularly updated? Because this kind of situation came so quickly that suddenly, you know, like we just need to know what's the difference between four months ago. We need to know now. We don't need to have data from one year ago because the world was very different one year ago. So I think, you know, for, for a minimum, I mean, I would say it's like 
pretty much the same type of data that we were using before, just much more refresh. It's one of the uh, biggest um, parts, right? Then on top of that, obviously, you know, like as the economy is moving towards, you know, like online and, you know, and there's a lot of now more, we see, you know, like, essentially we've accelerated 10 years of online um, kind of like transformation, if you want to say, on the, on the economy. And that is actually requiring many organizations to understand the relations of their performance, of their activities, working on the field and working online. So any data sets that helps to understand, you know, like the behavior and, you know, match these two worlds is becoming like more and more crucial too. So, um, but if something, you know, like most important is like find alternative sources that, you know, like help you to navigate in a situation where change is happening so quickly. Absolutely, absolutely. There's been some really big movements as well in the mobility space this year, you know, Google Mobility being launched, uh, the City Mapper Index being launched. It's, it's an exciting time to be a spatial data scientist because there is more data available than ever. Um, and a, one of the, the audience has asked, if you want to try out uh, BigQuery Tyler, how can you get involved? Sure, uh, there is actually a landing page we can put, we can paste here in the comments if you don't mind, Flor uh, Florence. You, there's like a, a, a landing page where you there's a form and you can just fill it up. We're still in beta, but uh, but if you fill it up, we will give you immediate access. So uh, it's pretty sweet. There's nothing to install because of this data multi tenancy that we were describing, and we're expecting you know to come to other next generation data warehouse on the months to come. It's and coming back, Flo, to your to your previous uh, point. It's true that, you know, like not only, I mean, it's exciting that we have these new data sets. We're kind of like in a way very lucky that now we have these new alternative data sources. We have this computing capacity. We have all these cloud native kind of like capabilities to really help us, you know, navigate this situation. I mean, like, I just cannot think, you know, how different would have been the analysis if COVID-19 happened 10 years ago. We're way more now enabled um, than before, thanks to these things. And and I think you're know, like, this is something you're know, like one of the biggest highlights. Absolutely. And you know, moving closer and closer to real time, but I think even some of our the data science community feel like right now that you actually can't even get real time enough with the way that lockdowns change from one night to another, the way cases evolve over time. Do you think that we'll ever get to like real near near real time? Or have you seen any interesting use cases that are like that this year? Well, I mean, that's kind of like reminds me of this a typical kind of like geographic uh, joke of like, if I want a map of one to one, right? So it's like, if you, it's never going to be possible to get, you know, like to a full real time because, you know, like you cannot get to know things as they happen exactly, right? Just, you know, like theoretically, it's just not possible, right? But obviously, I mean, things are going to get, you know, like closer and closer. And I think, you know, like, um, well, first of all, I mean, like most analysis do not need real time per se. So that's the important thing. When we try to call like push more towards real time, you know, like Carto and many providers and you know, um, technologies there, it's on the on the on the ways that you know, like we're moving, you know, from analysis that was done like, you know, like every two years to yearly. Now we're starting to see, you know, like more and more push towards monthly, and now it's we're gonna start seeing more and more kind of like um, you know, like analysis being done in organizations that can perform on a daily basis, and that's very very. Um, that's very, very clear. Will we need to call like no, you know, like just five minutes in advance? Some use cases will, like for example, things around like meeting the demand on on logistics around, you know, like public transport. Those things will happen. We will not have, we will not work on fixed schedules. If you want to say like, probably, you know, like the world will move to a more optimized uh, version. Um, there, you know, like there will be much more real time call like uh, analysis like this. But overall, I mean, like, it's something what we need is to kind of like put into effect, you know, like existing data sets, you know, at this at the time scale that we need. And in some cases, it's going to be challenging because of the sources of data. On the other, honestly, it's been purely the technology talents behind it, you know, to make it, you know, like in a way, uh, uh, you know, like perform in a daily basis. But uh, but yeah, I think we're going to get closer and closer for sure. Fantastic. Well, Javier, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, this will all be published online for everybody that's joining us. Uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel and shared afterwards over email. Um, and actually, the, the point that Javier has just made is a perfect segue into our next session, uh, where we think about, we're talking about real-time data, and uh, we're now going to be hearing from the travel industry, which has obviously uh, been massively impacted this year. 
And if you think about, you know, look over the past 10 years, how many Americans go to Spain per year or to Italy per year, that would have been quite a steady number, but that has completely changed in the course of a few months. Um, and very excited that we're going to be having Michele Ferretti joining us from booking.com. So we will now go across to his presentation. Thanks, Javier, for joining us. See you later.